okay now. From the beginning. Hit it, boys. Welcome to Insight. It's our first one for 2020, so I'm super excited to have you all here today. Um, my name's Naomi Tosik, so I'm one of the co-founders of The Office Space. So, hi guys. <laughs> we have a shared office upstairs, um, but for us, we're very interested in the world of work. And normally we open this series with a look at the future of workplace or um, future of work. But I think given the state of affairs at the start of this year, it's really important to look about at work as a source and an agent of good. So we're going to jump into that. Before I do, I do want to give um, a welcome to Jane Joyce, who's going to give our welcome to country and tell you a little bit about the Sydney Community Foundation. So Jane, take the stage. Thank you, Naomi. Um, oh, applause. <laughs> um, welcome, everybody, on Naomi's behalf. I'll just begin by acknowledging that we meet on the land of the Gadigal, people of the Aora Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present, and particularly emerging, and to anyone Indigenous who might be in the room. Um, I often pay particular respect to the women who I think do a lot in Aboriginal society in our contemporary culture to try and hold um, their community and their traditions together. Um, I've only got one minute, so I'm just going to say I run Sydney Community Foundation, which is a foundation for people to give to in this city and we will then distribute funds to people struggling and in need in the city. Most of our giving is supported by women who are donors and through Sydney Women's Fund and Naomi gives the proceeds of your tickets to us for programs that support women on a path to some greater safety and independence. Have a look at the website, there's lots of information on it and we're launching this book tomorrow which is a million dollars worth of really grassroots programs across Sydney that we'll be fundraising for this year. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks Jane, please. I will give you two minutes next month which is Women's Month, so I promise. <laughs> So our world and our way of life is facing wicked problems of critical proportions. I think we only need to look around and see climate disruption, species extinction, wealth disparities, which Jane's talked about, human rights and privacy violations, and displaced populations. So I've been researching and I think the corporate fingerprint to this is undeniable, whether that's through um, you know, environmental labour production practices or even just with apathy and, and not being involved. So I found it interesting the combined annual revenue of the top five global countries actually exceeds the GDP of 75% of the world's nations. So I think with that in mind, companies yield unprecedented power. And I don't know if anyone was paying attention to Davos. So in January 2020, uh, it was the 50-year anniversary and with the World Economic Forum. And with 3,000 participants from 130 countries, it was actually the um, highest concentration of economic power anywhere in the world. And the message from Klaus Schwab, who founded the World Economic Fund some 50 years ago, his message was, a company is more than the economic unit generating wealth. It fulfills human societal aspirations as part of the broader social system. So that's what we're talking about today. It's about that transition from institutions and government, and it's having um, companies and individuals using their work and their workplace to make a difference. So tonight we've got three excellent individuals that are doing that in different sectors. So in the commercial sector, we have co-founder of Future Super, Adam Verwe, which I'm going to introduce all of them up in a moment. But he's built a fund based on only clean energy and the demise of fossil fuels, but that's like a <laughs> secret. Um, in our community, we know Jackie as the amazing chef of Nomad, who's eaten over at Nomad. It's incredible next door. Um, and so Jackie Challenge spearheaded a movement that raised almost 150,000, probably over that now, for the bushfire appeal. 
And then in the cultural sector, we're very honoured to have Caroline Rothwell, who uses her art as a vessel of um, conversation and making change and commentary around how humans are in interacting with our natural environment. So please welcome our guests to the stage. And I'm going to swap over here. <laughs> so please come up to the stage. Exactly. So we've been running Insight for five years. We thought that we'd do something different and I'm now on this side and I now have a fringe. So if anyone's been, <laughs> just keeping you all engaged in this conversation. So um, I do have a theory and it's that great acts come from that convergence of opportunity, but frustration um, and of the conviction. So I actually want to start with the idea of conviction and find out what each of you believe. So Adam, I might start with you. You have a long history and ethical investment. Tell me about what you're passionate about. Tell us. Uh, it's what I'm passionate about. I mean, superannuation isn't doesn't sound like <laughs> something you can be passionate about. <laughs> uh, but for me, it is because there's, there's so much power that's in it. It's $2.9 trillion. It's a huge amount of power. When we think about the powerful people in our society who can uh, influence governments, influence what gets capital and whatnot, I mean, $2.9 trillion just dwarfs uh, what the power that those people have through their wealth. And so I sort of think, well, it's sort of unfair that uh, people who have personally enormous amounts of wealth get to have an influence, but all the rest of us don't. Uh, so I guess what I'm really uh, passionate about is about fairness and about people uh, using what's available to them to help take uh, sort of power back to make the changes that they want in the world. And if we dig a little deeper, you were on the Greens campaign in 2013. So obviously you're very passionate about environment mm -hmm. and you ended up meeting Simon Sheikh, who was the um, national director of Get Up. So tell us about how your the fire kind of happened with the <laughs> two of you. Yeah. Um, so I guess like, um, you know, climate change is sort of the ultimate unfairness. And we see it at the moment where uh, we've got school kids doing the hardest lifting in terms of us making, uh, taking action on climate change and yet they're not responsible for any of the, the problem uh, and they're going to um, yeah. obviously live through and inherit uh, all the worst of it. Uh, so I guess I was very motivated by action on climate change, I guess coming up to 2013 and seeing that there was a good chance that Tony Abbott was going to be Prime Minister. <laughs> uh, I was personally motivated to sort of be one of those people who puts up their hand and says they'll run for the Greens, you know, in one of those seats of the Greens, I'm going to win. Uh, but really wanting to help somebody who could win a seat for the Greens and help uh, try and protect some of the action on climate change that uh, the Gillard government had introduced in, in that previous term. Uh, and it just so happened to be that the person that I was uh, supporting for that campaign was uh, Simon Sheikh, who uh, was also running for the same reason. He cared very much about climate change. He put his hand up to run for the Senate in the ACT. Uh, and in particular for a seat where, uh, you know, and this is pretty rare, where a progressive candidate could take a seat away from a conservative candidate and try and uh, protect the legislation that way. Um, and then, uh, so just getting to work with him for a year, and for me this was really, you know, uh, amazing. So uh, I was a Greens voter, I was a progressive, I'd worked in ethical investment for about 10 years, but I guess I'd never truly seen what great grassroots organising looked like. <laughs> uh, and then I saw Simon come to my city and take uh, the Greens there and take it from like a group that had about 12 reliable volunteers <laughs> uh, to where a thousand people volunteered on his yeah. campaign. Uh, so he took, uh, it wasn't like Canberra didn't have lots of people motivated about action on climate change, but he activated them. Yeah. Uh, and it was yes. really, really amazing to see. Uh, and so, uh, and he got very close to getting elected as well. It was within a couple of hundred votes of getting elected, which would have been uh, amazing. Uh, but you wouldn't have found it. Wouldn't have found it, yeah, yeah. It's so. been pretty good for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and I think that's yeah. the interesting thing because it's that you share that frustration mm. that the government's not doing enough, but also there was a frustration. There was no clean options in terms of superannuation. We were talking you can mm. put money into clean energy, um, clean banking, but for superannuation it had been forgotten. So I'm going to park that idea and jump to Jackie. So we also had a laugh about this, Jackie. We're talking about how frustrated um, you were. You were obviously devastated seeing the fires and the effect, but feeling that need, something needed to be happening. Sorry, we weren't laughing about that. We were laughing because she was in her <laughs> underwear and started texting people. So tell us about that. Um, yeah. Start with uh, you in your underwear. <laughs> um, we obviously, um, you know, us at Nomad have always kind of had a pretty strong involvement with community and charity and and the team, just as much so as myself, but everybody was super frustrated with um, with what was going on and we just kind of felt like our hands were tied and wanting to do something but not knowing what. And 
on the Saturday night before the event, the week before the event, some of the, the staff came up to me and said, you know, what are we, what are we going to do? We have to do something. And and I saw the Sunday I was sitting at home on the couch in my undies. <laughs> it was really hot. Um, <laughs> and, and I just figured that, um, a, you know, we don't trade on Sundays. Um, and obviously, after going through a fire ourselves, wanted – wanting to help but obviously being concerned about how much financially as a business we were able to commit after being in such a and still being in a position where we're trying to kind of crawl our way out of that damage that from our own fire um so i figured that you know a little brunch would be a way to help raise ten thousand dollars maybe that wouldn't impact our trade or anything like that and and yeah, I just sort of started texting a few chef Who did mates. you text first? Um, Lennox from Fire okay. Door, um, Matt Moran, Jordan from Maryvale. Um, it just kind of snowballed and I had six people. By the time I'd spoken to the owners of the restaurant. I was going to say, I, this is before <laughs> she's got clearance from <laughs> Beck and Al. Um, by the time I'd spoken to them and they were like, yeah, we'll figure something out, I had six people on board and figured that was enough to go ahead with the event. And then that was Sunday afternoon. By the time we kind of got together to meet and discuss it, I already had 30 chefs on board and it kind of just snowballed from there. Yeah. Pretty amazing, I think. Yeah. Did anyone go and get the lamingtons and the brownies? It was incredible, the queues out here. Yeah. So we'll have a look more at the event. But Caroline... To you, we were talking about your background is in a family of botanists and a very scientific background. So art was an unusual path for you. But how did you find this as your way of kind of being curious about the world? And we discussed waging war in your own way. Yeah, um, actually, my, fam my father was an industrial chemist and my brother has got a master's degree in chemistry. And, you know, my, my, all my mother's side of the family are all Irish street botanists, you know, very knowledgeable about fungi and things. So I think <laughs> it was there in my blood. Um, but I also just found that, I, you know, I, that they were two generations away. And I think I was of that generation, you know, my, they were in their 40s when they had me. And I think I, it was of that, you know, educating girls was not part of their remit. Yeah. So I was just left my own devices. And, um, you know, my brother was busy getting, you know, scholarships into Cambridge University and this, that and the other. So anyway, I, I just found that my language was a visual language. Um, that was my way of communicating. I, I feel that there is, um, you know, a, a language beyond words. Um, and I've also, coming from that science background, I was also very aware of um, what was happening in the world around me. So, I, I, you know, this, this isn't a new story, this, this crisis that we're in. This has been like fed to us, you know. I think you, it, it, actually from the 1800s, people have been aware of this ri rising carbon yeah. dioxide issue. Um, so this is not new. So I've just been watching this crisis gradually unfold and just getting more and more, you know, frustrated and furious. And but I'm also interested in not necessarily being didactic. I think one of the things that art can do is actually have an insidious mm. kind of way in. You know, I get to hang out with future prime ministers and concrete layers. Yeah. So I actually can, you know, you can have a kind of quiet conversation with people without hammering them, even though I think hammering is really important. But I think, I think, um, I think I, I'm really interested in materials and processes and actually those are as important as the end product itself. So once you start to investigate how a work is made, whether it's made through industrial emissions, which is what I use some of my yeah. processes, or you know, the whole the whole building of that object or idea is just as important as the end product. And I, I'm sorry we haven't got a video of that, but we will try to show that at the end. It's a, a video work that Caroline's done, and she's used toxic fumes, noxious fumes, and actually made something quite beguiling and beautiful. So I think there's that duality in your work where hmm. it's quite beautiful. I remember the first one I saw actually at Rosanoxa Gallery, and it was this beautiful girl with this balloon, and it looks so innocent. But tell us about the message behind that. It's like being drawn in and... Well, maybe I will talk to the animation just because hopefully you'll get to see it later on. Um, I mean, I am very interested in ideas of beauty and actually drawing, seducing a viewer through beauty. So the animation I used, actually it showed at Rosalind's um, last year. I, I was, and I'm interested in timelines and looking back to look forward. So 
I started looking at imagery from the 17, late 1700s, which is the start of the sort of industrialization of the West, um, and looking at Rococo imagery and, you know, there's very sort of grandiose and decorative notions and actually tracking what was happening um, to the planet concurrently. So actually the, half of the CO2 in the atmosphere has come into the atmosphere since the 1780s. And I thought, okay, what if I actually start to use this imagery of that time? And actually I, so I collected pollutants from you know, I've had people sending them from Philadelphia. <laughs> I've been to Philadelphia and had them use them from the smokestack emissions. I collect them from people's exhaust pipe. I have people sending me, sending me their emissions. And I make, so I basically mix them with a, um, with a binder medium. It's what the Victorians used to do. I don't know if you've heard of the term lamp black. You know, people used to basically, you know, collect the black um, carbon outside of the inside of lamps and mix that with a binder and use it as a paint. Um, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm just using um, carbon emissions out of in, as a sort of recycling an industrial waste product and turning it into a paint. Um, so I, I, I paint onto glass, which again is another Victorian process. Yeah. But then I animate that, so it's kind of, you know, they're they're quite beautiful. They kind of feel like clouds, and they're, you know, but they're, so that's are they toxic? Are they beautiful? I'm just trying to get people to. Well, I suppose for myself as well, again, it's, yeah, just thinking through systems of landscape. And for me, representation of landscape is political, you know, landscape is politics. Our, um, our landscape has become our side of the political, you know. It's a great war, segue. really. And I think that's where Karen was saying she's always waging war, but in such a way that is not isolating people. It's bringing them into the conversation and using facts and mm. science. So, Adam, for you, if we think about um, the funds that you are investing in, tell us a little bit about the portfolio and how you've managed to eradicate all the fossil fuels from your investments. Um, yeah, so, which is actually when you're starting from zero dollars in your portfolio is pretty easy because yeah. <laughs> you get to start from scratch. Uh, but we, uh, I mean, our super fund looks a lot like all other super funds. Uh, you know, super funds usually just invest in everything. Uh, if it makes money, they'll invest in it and they provide no layer of values over the top of that. Yeah. Uh, whereas we've just decided that it's important to overlay values. We don't uh, leave our values at the door when we make our, our purchasing decisions. We don't leave them at the door at any time, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, super funds act as if we do. So it was really about saying, well, there are things we won't invest in and we won't invest in fossil fuels and we won't invest in gambling and we won't invest in things that essentially uh, destroy our environments and destroy people's lives. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we just built a portfolio from that. So we just left out the things that do that um, mm -hmm. from the beginning. And then uh, also decided, well, we actually want to proactively as well invest in the things that are helping to create the positive change we want, and in particular around renewable energy. Uh, and, you know, usually with a super fund, you get to choose between like, oh, do I choose a balanced option or a conservative option or aggressive option? Whereas for us, you get to choose what type of positive impact you yeah. want to create. So. 70% of our members choose to create impact specifically for re renewable energies and action on climate change and others choose to have a broader impact around that, but also like things like homelessness and addressing mental health and, and so on. Uh, so it's kind of cool that you get to choose impact rather than choose something a bit more boring. Like, yeah, <laughs> like numbers. Like, like, yeah, yeah. And we talked about, I mean, it's incredible, from 1,000 members in the first year, mm -hmm. these guys have grown to over 33,000 mm -hmm. within six years. So mm -hmm. talk to us. I'm sure all the marketers in the room are curious how you've built the acquisition process, but how have you built the tribe that has gathered mm -hmm. around this venture? Yeah. So I guess um, one place to start is to say, I already worked in ethical investment for 10 years <laughs> before I started this business. And it was really frustrating to see there were so many people who wanted to invest in an ethical way, in a way that aligned with their values. They wanted to make the change of their money, but so few people did it. Yeah. Like, uh, like maybe like 5% of the people who said that they wanted to invest that way were actually following through and doing it. Uh, and so there's something wrong with that. So I think one of the great things about meeting Simon and seeing him do all this amazing uh, community organizing was thinking, well, this is how we change my industry. You know, we change the way that people communicate with each other. We create a movement to bridge the gap between the people who say they'll use their money uh, in this way and the people who actually make that decision. Uh, and I guess that means having to build a company that has different people in it to what you normally have in a super fund. Uh, and actually, there's a few of them <laughs> in the middle row there. So um, maybe they do or don't do you look like they're normal superannuation. <laughs> they're all millennials. Um, I'm still just a millennial. Yeah. <laughs> just pointing that out for, for them. Uh, but like in, in particular, like 
hiring, not hiring people who are financial experts and teaching them about climate activism and making climate activists about them, but bringing in people who are climate activists, who are activists around equality uh, and helping them to learn about uh, superannuation and finance. And that way, you know, talking to people who are interested in us and having a really compelling and interesting conversation with them about it. But I also think it just had to change the way that we talk about uh, superannuation and talk about why uh, it's important. And I think talking about different things that are much more interesting, like it's not interesting to talk about returns. And it's not interesting to talk about like risk, financial risk. Uh, and you're not going to talk to your mates about it. Like you're not going to sit down at dinner and say, you wouldn't believe the return I got for my yeah. son today. Uh, <laughs> but but are you more, okay, okay, yeah. I mean, maybe, a bit, maybe it's amazing. Yeah, you might, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so they wouldn't, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in the second row back, they're not talking about that at dinner. Uh, so what would be a really interesting conversation? Well, really interesting conversation is what is my superannuation doing with its money and what impact is that having on my life and what impact is that having on my future and being able to play about it in interesting ways. And it's also interesting for you to see your own super fun, act out your values, act out your mm. politics yeah. as well. And I think to make that change, it was really about putting impact before everything else, yeah. putting impact uh, even before acquisition. So choosing to say... We want to make an impact on how other super funds invest. And by having that impact, people will join us. Yeah. They'll see us as leaders, they'll see us as genuine and they'll come on board. Uh, we want to be a, a leader uh, to other businesses who are about our size as well. Um, and the people in those businesses will see us be a leader and they'll come on board. Uh, and there's a certain element of sort of trust that comes, uh, that has to come from saying, if we lead with impact, people will come along. Yeah. Uh, you have to trust us, we're still going to build a good business, not just be an impactful business. Um, and so that, in, you know, that involves not just finding the right um, people to be members and join us, but finding the right people to back us as a business. The shareholders in our business have to trust that yeah, sure. by putting impact first, we will build a really great big business for them, which will return them uh, a profit on their investment that and they made. I'd want to come back to an example of how you've done that, which was really important. But I think very much when when we look at Future Super, it's all about those values are coming first. So Jackie, just to stay with the idea of building a tribe, in a way, there's almost the idea that top chefs are competitors and they're kind of fighting for the same covers in a city. What was it like getting all of these, can I say, egos or celebrity <laughs> chefs together? How did you all play and um, how did sort of everyone rally around this idea? Um, Give us the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, there isn't. Um, everyone... There was no ego and there was, you know, there was no element of competition or anything like that. And it was, it was never a, a matter of promoting Nomad or making money for Nomad. It was always about the community and what we could do to help. So I think that was a big contributing factor. But honestly, everybody came in and just did what they needed to do. And they were so easy to work with and willing to just do what they needed to do to help. I think... Originally, I was like, oh, let's bring 50 of each dish. And then two days later, I was like, no, I need 100 of each <laughs> yeah. dish. And nobody complained. Nobody said they were too busy. There was none of that. It was just like, whatever you need, if you want 200, I'll bring 200 of everything. Mm -hmm. And and it just kind of spread. So, yeah, I, you know, it is a competitive industry, absolutely. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't really notice a lot of... And I think this led the way uh, after, I guess, the desperation of the fires, just for someone, for an, a group to really show solidarity, which yeah. I really like. To talk us through the specifics, it turned out to be three different events on the 19th, Sunday the 19th of yes. Jan. So what happened? What did you have going on? Um, so we had the brunch at Nomad. Um, we did 470 covers there. Wow. <laughs> In a dining room that seats 170. <laughs> we turned that a few times. Um, so the original plan was to just have the dining room and then set up some tables at the front and do a little bake sale just because, you know, just to kind of maximise the money that we could make. Um, and by 8.30 on the day, the Monday that we released the tickets, we were at 450 covers already and we just like, turned off. <laughs> Shut it down. <laughs> um, so once we realised that there was such a huge demand, my phone started just going off the hook. Um, you know, I had Frank Roberts from Maryvale in the middle of service saying, can I donate all the booze for the event? Yeah. Um, so it just, it ticked off so quickly and I think I knew that I had something on my hands that was bigger than what we ever imagined. Um, so, so you got pulled out of the kitchen yeah, for a for week. A How was that for you? Uh, yeah. It was good. It's good. I enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> so we, we've got a really great relationship with the restaurants around us. So the guys from Chin Chin, 
um, we reached out to them and they offered us their bar space. So we did the bake sale out of that. Um, and then from there, I had so many people contacting me asking for reservations for the brunch. And I felt horrible because I couldn't do it. And there were so many people wanting to contribute and help. So I reached out to the guys from Paramount and asked if I could have the rooftop space, which they just handed over straight away. So we got the rooftop and we did a like an aperitivo hour kind of thing. I got Fass and Manu and those big shots to um <laughs> to get up there and we got some paella pans and we got the guys from Tio's to do cocktails and it just, we ended up doing three completely different events. And I think it was nice because we sort of covered three different buy-in points with a bake sale was, you know, you could get something for 10 bucks. Yeah. Whereas the brunch was your mid range and then we sort of did the higher priced event there. So it sort of made it accessible to all the different levels of community and how much you wanted to donate. So that was... And then the online sale. And yeah, well. I forgot about that. We yeah. had the auction. Um, that was that was Beck's idea, actually. The one of the owners. Um, I went in there saying I wanted to raise ten grand, and she's like, "No, we can do a hundred. I'm like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> what? Um, and she's like, "Why don't we do an online auction?" And that just really snowballed out of control really quickly to the point where we couldn't even manage it anymore. I ended up getting my sister in who is in marketing um, and she just basically gave up her job for a week and, and set up shop in our office and just took over that. So we did, on the day, on the Sunday, we raised 75,000 and then we did another 75 with yeah, the auction. So. Well done. Yeah. 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 Very good. And another person that was involved in the auction was Caroline for a different auction. It was the home auction that some of you might have been to, which was about artists coming together. So um, Caroline had Lily and it was this beautiful sculpture which got the highest amount, $15,000 at the auction, which was a huge contribution for one person to kind of put that forward. So for you, a lot of your work, it's all about the flora and it's almost human kind of interaction, but I love how you're reframing the idea of what's weeds and um, kind of what's the role of jungle and kind of plant and human interaction. So maybe you can talk us through a bit of your creative practice. That's a big ask. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a biggie. Um, okay, so that, the yeah, I mean, just actually going back to the auction, that was amazing. I mean, a few of us decided it would be a good thing to do and then the whole... I mean, they, you know, they've just demolished the Minister of the Arts. Yeah. Um, you know, put it, put it, put arts into transport, um, and it's just, you know, it, 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 there is something that's really sort of devastating in this country at the moment because n neither side of government is will support the yeah. arts. It's um, it's uh, yeah. So, but uh, so the arts community is out there kind of raising money for the community while the government tries to demonise the arts community as these um. Anyway, yeah, no. but um, so um, in terms of flora and fauna, I, I mean, I'm from England, so and I moved to New Zealand a while ago because I married a New Zealander, and and I've always kind of walked and looked at landscape and tried to understand where I am from the perspective of landscape. So in New Zealand, I could buy a book and you know it's this thick, and you read it and you look at the tree and you, you know you build a relationship and you. So I thought, okay, I'll do a similar thing when I get to, got to Australia. Of course, there's 700 gum trees and there's sort yeah, of, yeah. you know, you can't build that <laughs> relationship in the same way. It's amazing. But going back to New Zealand, I had um, found this book called The Weeds of New Zealand, published in 1926. And on the front cover was the silver fern, and I, which is now the national icon. And I thought, how amazing, actually, as a cultural moment within, you know, less than 100 years, there's something is a weed at one mm. point because you know they're clearing land so they can plant grass so they can bring in the sheep um, but within a hundred years there's been such a shift of understanding of environment understanding of sort of a post-colonial dialogue understanding kind of the amazing um, uh, you know value of, of those plants I was really interested in that parallel way of being able to talk about again colonial land environment um, you know, f from from a perspective of, of flora and fauna. So I really play with those ideas. I I use a lot of humour. I use a lot of hybridity. You know, at the moment I'm using, I'm making plants, but they they they've got drains in them and taps in them. <laughs> and they've got sort of human limbs kind of growing out of them because I'm 
I think my whole premise is to try and reconnect us yeah. so that we're not, um, you know, lording it over the environment. We're actually completely part of it. So yeah. we are animal. We are, you know, we are land. We are, we are just part of it. We're not on top of it. So I kind of, I find myself going around kind of paying homage to trees, you know, <laughs> at <laughs> the moment. It. And, kind of, and um, Caroline's <laughs> just finished a project which uh, is on Bathurst Street around the corner. So it was William Smart's building and you were commissioned to do some bronze um, sculptures coming out the side, which is it's incredible because um, it was about biophilia and the need for office plants. But tell us about the idea of what these plants are representing. Yeah, so... I, I'm really interested in that that idea of biophilia. Like we need nature; it's just an inherent part of us. I mean, there's all these there's all this these statistics around. Actually, you know, if you've got a council estate, the more trees and land around it, the more green space around it, the less crime there is. You know, there's all these amazing statistics around kind of trees and environment and you know human society. And I was just um, looking at these ideas of, I've always been really interested in these really dusty, sad little peace lilies that we have hanging around in our offices and, you know, um, but how we still want them. And I just thought, wouldn't it be interesting actually if the if these plants actually kind of could explode out of the side of a building, you know, they, they take on the building. Um, and so, I, uh, you know, but also that whole idea of the wilderness, the jungle, like even that's a kind of colonial construct, mm. you know, that the or the jungle is anyway it's sort of you know most of these plants come from the south you know they're not they're, they're from the amazon they're from um you know they're not they're not from here so i was or from where you know the local community is from so i very purposely included a kentia palm which is from lord howe island it's actually an amazing office plant yeah. um you know, and a monstera, which has to be everywhere, you know, the cheese plants. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm just interested in the idea of plants as um, ciphers for something else. And I like that it kind of piques that curiosity, but also makes us think about the role of nature. And mm. particularly, I was excited to have Caroline because this is traditionally, like I said, it's a, a workplace topic and we often would have... Um, maybe developers on the panel and talking about that. But I love that you were challenging this notion and bringing some, mm. I guess, humanity into an urban environment. Mm. So talking about resistance and plants fighting back, I want to ask each of you how, um, what kind of resistance, because whenever there's a movement, I think you can expect resistance. So Adam, what are your thoughts about the challenges when you are making a movement like Future Super? Um, I think the main challenge that I had and, and my co-founder had was Probably more pers personal resistance. For instance, we, um, you know, in terms of building a business, we created a product that was exactly what a whole movement of people needed at the right time. Uh, and actually, it's been a, you know the challenges of actually about letting everybody know that we have this product, and as soon as they find out about it, they want to invest in yeah. it. Uh, and so, uh, so that hasn't really been the challenge. I think the challenge has been in building a business when we started six years ago. Like, uh, we had nothing to lose, right? We were taking a risk, but we had nothing. Uh, and then as you keep building up a... Now you've got these people in the back row. That <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, now we've got... Um, Wages. Yeah, so you, you start and, you know, we had a couple of uni grads uh, and, and me and Simon and we were just doing whatever we could um, and sort of being woefully sort of naive uh, and achieving a lot of things we probably shouldn't have in hindsight now that we know yeah. a bit more about what we're doing. Um, but equally as we kept building the business, uh, all of a sudden you look around and feel like, well, actually, like, now there's a business here. <laughs> like, uh, there is a risk. There is, something to, um, there is something to lose. And trying to stay really true to having the impacts you want while still protecting something you've built, um, I think is something that sort of plays on your, on your mind a bit, but you didn't have when you, when you started yeah. out. Um, but I also know we're lucky enough to be a business that is the exact right business that's needed at this point in time and that lots more people know about that. You know, in, in the last two months, uh, more people have joined our fund than joined in our entire first year yeah. uh, when people didn't quite make the connections between their money and the impact as well. But yeah. they do now and our business is already five years old. So, uh, yeah, I don't really see the resistance being, being there. I think the resistance is are we great actually going to um, keep taking the risks that help um, build the movement, yeah. And for you, Jackie, what was it was a really challenging period because you turned around a huge event within a week. So I guess um, for you, what was the, the resistance? What were the hard parts? There was stock going everywhere. So talk yeah, us through the challenge. I think I like, agree with you on that. It wasn't because, you know, everybody who was involved in the event, in the event sorry, was so, they, everyone was a dream. It went, everybody worked so well. So I think for me, it was more of a personal challenge just 
you know, I'm, I'm a chef. I like to hide in the background and, you know, so it just, because it all blew up so quickly, like it was just literally nothing stopped. My like email, Instagram, Facebook, phone calls, I didn't stop. Like I couldn't keep up with it. I didn't know how to keep up with it. And I didn't know how to field all of that stuff. You know, I've had my fair share of media stuff over the years, but nothing to that degree where I couldn't not respond. I had to do it. And it got to the point where we had to set up an, an additional email address to just filter all the all the, the requests and everything. Um, so that was really difficult for me because I'm just, that's not my background. I'm not an event planner. I'm not, you know, it, it was, that was totally a new challenge for me to wrap my head around and to kind of figure out how to separate that a little bit because it was just a week of, you know, three hour sleeps and just not eating and, and just doing what you had to do to get it done. Um, but as far as resistance, we, you know, the community was amazing. My team was amazing. My family was like everyone, everyone just kind of jumped. So it was more for me learning how to Maybe. attack something different to what I would normally do and figure out how to deal with all of that sort of stuff. So. And Caroline, for you, the question's a bit different. We were talking about you are an independent, you don't have shareholders, and perhaps that's why the government might be afraid of artists, that you are kind of a loose cannon in a way. So talk to us about that, the politicisation of art and your power in that. Well, my, my husband's a filmmaker, and he always says that, you know, as an artist, I can make a work with nothing. I can make it with some industrial emissions. Yes. <laughs> um, whereas he has to, you know, mortgage the house and sort of, you know, to realise a film and it can take years. Yeah. Um, so, I, and I, but I do think actually something positive is coming out of what's happening in the moment is people are sort of aware. I think, I think there is a movement. I think people are getting out of their silos and actually prepared to, um, you know, have, I mean, cross dialogues and talk, talk across platforms. Um, I, I just hope that it doesn't go back to business as usual. Mm. I, I think one of the interesting things in Australia that is different to um, England, I think Europe perhaps, is that, you know, my dad was a very conservative human being, but he had a, a really deep kind of care of land and environment. And it seems that here land and environment is political in that mm. if you somehow if you care for the sort of land and environment you must be lefty mm, yeah. or kind of a greenie um, and it, it seems that that idea of the frontier that constant it's like okay we've got to constantly kind of um, you know find the next technology or sort of you know mine it drill it sort yeah. of um, and, I, and, and it does seem it does seem that we are in our kind of tribal territories and actually maybe we have this moment right now to, to cross over. It feels like, you know, farmers and the rural community are, you know, sort of interested in talking to, I don't know, the Green Party and, yeah. you know, or, or not even yeah. talking to, but having the same thoughts and the same conversations. And, um, and I think in terms of art, I mean, I'm really lucky to have a gallery, amazing gallery like Ros and Oxy supporting me. Um, but I think within the arts community, within, say, the galleries, the state and regional galleries, it can be quite hard for them to have the political um, exhibitions because they don't get the funding, they sure. don't get the um, support. So it's um, in the same way as with the Rural Fire Service. If they mentioned climate change, their funding would, didn't yeah. come get through. Um, and it's the same thing within the arts. If you mentioned environment or climate change the, the the exhibitions wouldn't get up so it had to be this sort of you know slow burn meandering through I mean I'm very lucky this year I've got a solo show at Hazelhurst um, art gallery which happens to be ScoMo's electorate yeah. and um, <laughs> bring him in <laughs> and it's also 250 years since the landing at um, you know Kernel Botany oh. Bay which is also part of that whole region so I've got a I've got a really big dialogue plan, so please all come along. We are all going to be there. <laughs> you said a fantastic comment that you hope it's not business as usual, which is a great lead in. Mm. Adam, tell us about it's not business as usual. <laughs> I said it the wrong. You said I hope it's not business as usual. So tell us about the initiative that was a, a big spring, springboard for you guys. Yeah, uh, and it's, it's really about... Um, you know, one of our first true efforts to put impact beyond even growing our business, growing our Did ministry. you all hear about it's not business as usual? Yeah. 
So yeah, when the businesses were letting people take the day off and leading by example. So tell us about how that started. Uh, yeah, and it's um, and I guess if you sort of want to think about how businesses usually I think don't about know these about sort of it, events. Yeah. I work for myself. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you were so, there, yeah. so if I take the day off, I'm <laughs> yeah. uh, Well, I guess when there's usually like some big events, so there's Mardi Gras on this weekend, yeah. and usually what corporates would do is they would just brand hijack it. They just put their logos all over it uh, to try and get some sort of um, association with it and therefore try and yeah. uh, sort of have people associate their brand with it and maybe they'll grow out of it. Uh, and to be honest, like our business did the same initially. Like we genuinely had those values, but we turn up to climate marches and we collect people's signatures and, you know, are you interested in joining Future Super Media? Like we get a couple of hundred people <gasps> join us out of it, but that'd be it, right? Like we're just turning up and collecting yeah. uh, new joins on the day. And now that we're a bit bigger and our team's far more capable, we've got amazing uh, campaigners in our team, sort of thinking, well, actually, how do we have a much better, bigger impact? How do we actually properly build the movement rather than just turn up and just collect new members on the day? Uh, so, uh, so our team was thinking, well, actually, the biggest thing we could do is to convince other businesses to allow their staff to take the day off of work to accompany their children uh, to the climate strikes or just go along themselves. Uh, knowing that actually the biggest barrier uh, for most people was thinking, well, actually, like, is, is my boss going to be okay with me taking a, a you know, very, very long lunch break to go to a, a climate strike? And uh, maybe not coming back. <laughs> maybe not coming back, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so initially we thought, well, it would be pretty amazing if we could convince, uh, you know, a few hundred businesses to, to come out and join us. So we'd already decided we're going to shut down our office for the day. Uh, we're going to tell all our members, you know, like, there's no service that day. We're all going to the climate strike, yeah. you should too. But equally, we're going to go out and tell uh, lots of other businesses to do the same. They don't have to close down for the day like we are. They could do as little as just send an email to their staff saying, you know, it's okay, like take the day off, you know, no consequences. Uh, and then uh, we got 3,000 businesses signed on, uh, which was amazing. Yeah. And some of them were small, like <coughs> two-person pool cleaning businesses, uh, which was, I mean, those were really wonderful ones to get where they were like, this yeah. is amazing that we're a business and two people and we can be part of a community doing this. And some of them were huge, like Atlassian. Uh, joined as well with their uh, thousands of employees uh, and uh, it was amazing like I actually I, I had a poorly timed holiday at the same time as the climate strikes <laughs> and I was in Germany when it happened and it was some it amazing sounds like climate. ScoMo <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> you better come to the exhibition uh, sorry but even even when I was I, I got up uh, I got up to watch the coverage of it and I could hear this campaign being referenced as one of the reasons why there was uh, so many more people yeah, turning ooh, up in Australia to the strikes. Uh, the Australian There's a lot of publicity around yeah, that. Yeah, um, so the Australian reported that uh, the turnout was twice as big in part to adult workers being able to turn up yeah. to those strikes, uh, which was amazing. And then obviously the consequence of those strikes is, you know, uh, the continued degradation of social licence for fossil fuel companies and other contributors to climate change. But also we've seen, like, world's biggest fund manager, BlackRock, have come out recently and said, mm -hmm. we'll no longer invest actively in fossil fuels. Yeah. And one of the reasons is, like, how many people came out and marched last year? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and as someone who's marched quite a bit, like it's nice to get validation that it, <laughs> that it, <laughs> really, that it yeah. really works. Um, and at the same time, uh, so we ran this big campaign. Um, there's three, now 3,000 businesses all uh, looking to us to help them take their next actions. Uh, but also, like we didn't go out to run an acquisition campaign, but our amount of people who joined us doubled uh, mm -hmm. afterwards, mm -hmm. which was a really great validation for saying if you put impact first if you try and be a leader in your movement if you try and build the movement you know like people will, will see that and really want to want to jump on board i love that um jackie just to look at nomad with the values that as a restaurant they represent it's the same idea of locally sourced and often that can be a challenging road because it's more expensive it's harder work but tell us how that has built i guess a great following at nomad i think it's such a you know, everybody is so focused on it and I think we're really lucky in that the people that do come to Nomad want to support our vision and how we choose to buy and, and support local. Um, it does absolutely come with its challenges and, and, and resistance, I suppose. Um, it, buying this sort of produce does come at a price and obviously as a business we have to pass that price on to our customers um, but especially now you know with the drought the prices of lamb and meat and all that stuff are shot through the roof um, we use the beautiful Alto um, who make amazing olive oils and produce table oils um, down from the southern highlands and they've just had to cancel a whole line of olives um, which we use for one of our signature desserts because of the drought it's just wiped out the whole 
the whole crop. And I'm hearing that so frequently now, like we, across so many of our suppliers that this is now affecting our food chain and our supply and it's going to mm. start getting worse and worse. We're only sort of just starting to see the results of it now after years of drought, it's only really hitting. Um, so that's pretty scary. But, you know, I we've always received such great support from the community and, and allowing us to buy the produce that we do and, and continue to p purchase it. And I had one of our meat suppliers come in the other day trying to offer me New Zealand lamb. Not that there's anything no. wrong with oh, that. No, it was delicious. I tried it, but it was this, I just married this yeah. moral dilemma of sitting there and they're like, was it, is this something that you would consider buying? And yes, the price was dramatically cheaper, but right now is that something that I'm pre and, my, and the rest of the business prepared to make the change for the sake of the price and, and not support our farmers and the people who we have been buying off for the last six years just for that shift in price? And I think... The climate at the moment is just focusing on supporting Aussie and supporting local and doing that. So it's great. You know, I think it's really lovely to see that we do have people coming in and not mm. complaining about price point or anything like that. Because for all of us within the business, it's important to continue doing that. So you won't see kiwi lamb on the menu <laughs> anytime soon. Um, but yeah. I, and I think important. it's a good representation of it's lots of the little decisions you make. It's the kind of outside the box decisions mm -hmm. and it's sort of the deep thought. There's a lot of scientific method in your work, Alan. I might end on an idea of yours about it's in true botany form. It's about the hive and gestation. So talk us through what you think solutions are. It's kind of about social scale and making a change, I guess, in the same way that we were talking about bees. So maybe you can comment. You were talking about bees. So it's an <laughs> ecology <laughs> reference that. <laughs> can you remember? <laughs> um, uh, no, I can't remember. Okay. What about at all, but, but I do think, I mean, I think, I think what Jackie was just saying, those decisions are so important. Mm. And I think that or, or everything we're doing at this sort of grassroots level, I mean, I've, I'm finding that with my own practice as well, I think coming out of the chemistry background is I'm just desperate to, you know, I'm using resins. To, to, to laminate my work, and I'm desperately trying to find bioresins at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at res resins that are made of soybeans, and also trying to find, um, um, you know, casting materials that's plant-based. And so I just think, and, and I keep bothering all my suppliers and, so, and emailing them and saying, you know, let me know. This is what I want. This is what I want. And I think the more that we kind of keep doing that and actually asking yeah um but yet yeah, but I, I suppose i am again really interested in those systems and we are part of this superstructure and actually and the ripple effect does sure. yeah, yeah i mean it, there, there is a ripple effect in every everything that we do yeah it's a great way to end, oh, I think. Yeah. So again, thank yeah, you to yeah. our three incredible guests who've been here. I wanted to speak with each of them for hours on end. It was so interesting. Um, I would love to draw your attention to two things. Some of you might have um, a fly, which is about the office space. It's our little bit to do for the bushfire appeal because we also had a fire. Um, so we kind of understand the impact that fire can have on a business. So any of our new office leases, we're just getting our business at Reservoir up and running. So um, if we lease anything in February or even just a referral, we're going to give the full month rent. So there's quite a bit that we can um, contribute that will go to a Shoalhaven business to try and help them. And then, Nicola, if you've got the next one. The next one is, so it is Women's Month. I don't want any men to be terrified and not come. So I'd love if men are actually coming as well. But we celebrate women in business. But this month, I want to make it dangerous women. So um, yeah. I think it's just incredible. It's about raising capital and raising hell out yeah. there in the business world. Yeah. Um, so we have Nicola Masfield, who's here. She'll be up here next month. So she's the um, Managing Director of Interbrand here in Australia. And um, Danielle Harvey, who founded Festival, uh, she's a curator and founder of Festival of Dangerous Ideas. So it's sort of a bit of the inspiration for this topic. And then someone super exciting that I can't announce yet till she's confirmed in her calendar, but um, we're going to have an amazing artist here as well. So please join us, men and women. It's going to be Friday the 27th. Um, it's going to be the champagne brunch and then it's a daytime thing. So that's it. But thank you everyone for being here.